Hi guys, so we're going to Georgia State University. They put a law school open house. And let's see what happens. Right here, sir, sir. He didn't even say anything. Just here go another driver that don't tell me nothing. Hello. Let me see if this is it or not. Let's find out. Is this open? Hello? Hello? Uh-uh. Hello? 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 I hear something. Good morning. Good morning. Oh, Lord, every time. Good morning. Turn forward. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, let's see. Go to the left? Yeah, just a little bit. Okay. Yes. Okay, so that's all good. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. You just keep going straight? Uh, yes, keep going straight. Then come up to the other right. Ooh, yeah. mm -hmm. Oh. Left the okay. And then we're gonna go down. We're going to the second floor. Oh yeah, we're going yes. up. Yes. I don't know why she said lower level. Go to your left a bit. Ooh. Yeah. Um, let's see here. I don't know which way they are. Parts see. room two oh four. Stop right here. Okay. Um because I don't know which one. Let's try. Let's okay, let's walk. Okay. Come around to the right. Okay. Is this for open house? Okay. Hey. How are you? Doing well, how are you? Very good, thanks. Uh, your name, if you don't mind. Um, Kelly. At this time, I would like to introduce our Dean, uh, Professor, Dean and Professor of Law, LaVonda Reed, who will be making some uh, welcoming remarks. Dean Reed. Thank you, Monique. I appreciate you so much. Uh, thank you for assembling this wonderful group of prospective students and family members. Karen, I had an opportunity to talk to one parent in the lobby as I was coming in this morning. Um, we are just delighted that you are here and that you are considering uh, pursuing legal education. Um, I have been here at the College of Law for almost two years, and I've been in legal education for a little over 20 years right now. And it has been a wonderful experience for me to be able to serve the profession in this way and bringing in new uh, law students and prospective and future attorneys um, to our society. Um, I, uh, let's see, so tell me a little bit about it. <laughs> Another one? Did I miss somebody else? Elementary? Oh, yes, I knew this year. Thank you all for being here. I don't know whether you guys are here because you're really thinking about law school for yourselves or whether you're tagging along with a big sister or mom or dad or grandma, I'm not sure. But thank you. Welcome to you all to, to um, our Georgia State University College of Law. It's important that you start thinking early on about, you know, your education and what you think you might want to do when you grow up. And, um, you know, this is a space where we are all about inspiring people to achieve their ambitions. And whether you decide to be a lawyer or a teacher or a doctor or an astronaut, whatever, um, you know, this is just part of the journey of exploring what is available to you. So thank you for being here. And, and um, growing up to brought them, thank you for bringing them along. Um, here at the law school, we um, have a student body of just under 700 students. We have a full-time program uh, that is uh, in the day and then an evening program, which brings a lot of uh, diversity and enrichment <coughs> to our student population. Many of our part-time students are what we might call non-traditional students in that they're not pre-K through JD. <laughs> they may have taken some time away for, um, for a career and they may continue to work while they're in school. Um, 
we also house an LLM program for lawyers who have been educated outside the United States, but they have come to our law school for the purposes of gaining the U.S. credential so that they can sit for the bar exam here in Georgia. Our, st our student body and our faculty are very, very diverse from the standpoint of race and gender and sexual orientation and religion and age. Um, and that's again, and geographically in increasingly, and that's something that we are very, very um, proud of. Um, yesterday, I met Tamara from Seattle. There she is. Yeah. <laughs> and um, so welcome uh, for coming all the way across country to engage with us as well today. Um, I, uh, I went to law school on the West Coast myself, and so, you know, I'm happy to see you here um, in Atlanta. Our law school is also situated in the... Um, I have, in my uh, almost two years here at the law school, been focused on, obviously, bringing the law school back online after the pandemic. And some of you guys are probably having a pre-bar preparation um, um, activity and, and program for so they're over there um, on the tail end of what you guys are commencing. They're over there stressing out a little bit, but, uh, <laughs> but they have started early, which is, is wonderful. And I just want to you know, tell you guys that you guys are starting early in the admissions process for law school. So similarly situated, that's uh, the, the, the people who show up on Saturday morning, I think, have something in common on the front end of this process or on the back end of this process. Um, Monique, anything else you need me to tell the, the group? I think you've done a fantastic okay. job. We appreciate your being here on a Saturday morning. Well, I hope to see you guys on a better day. I hope to see you either in the fall, uh, in, in, in maybe seven years for Valencia, who's there in the back, participant in our Justice Benham Law Camp this summer. And for the youngsters here, we'll talk about maybe about 16 years from now. Future participants in Law Camp. That's right. Future participants in Law Camp. And then maybe future law students in sometime in the next decade. All right, everyone, enjoy your day. If you have any needs, um, I know that Monique and Shantae and Sydney, who are wonderful, wonderful colleagues here at the law school, can answer any of the questions that you have. Thank you. Thank you so much, yeah, Henry. Absolutely. So I should mention we do have some people that are joining us virtually, live stream. So for those of you who are um, joining us, welcome. Happy to have you. Uh, you are welcome to add any questions, to send them to us via email, to law admissions, all one word, lawadmissions at gsu.edu, and we'll be sure to get to your questions um, uh, throughout the program. So we'll go ahead and get started. So Dean Reed already gave you a good overview of the College of Law. We are in our 40th year, so in the whole scheme of things, we're still a baby law school. Um, but just what we've been able to accomplish in 40 years is something that we're very, very proud of. Our student body, which includes our JD and our LLM students, just under 700. And again, we are very pr proud of the flexibility. So uh, for part-time students, those who are interested in our part-time program, we have both part-time day and part-time evening. So students who are in our full-time program, you take an average of about 15 credits uh, per semester. If you're in our part-time program, you take about 10 credits per semester. So full-time, you'll finish in three years. If you're really motivated, you could do it in two and a half years by taking classes in the summers. Um, traditionally, students who are in our part-time program will do that in four years, again, with taking some classes in the summer. Um, and then we have a number of dual degrees where you can pursue both your law degree and a master's at the same time. And if you are doing that in a full-time setting, that will be about four years. If you're doing that part-time, that will be about five years. Just sharing some of our points of pride. We have consistently been recognized for our health law program. Uh, we're currently ranked number three in the nation. There should be new results coming out within the next um, few days. But we've consistently been in the top 10 for about the last 10 years. Uh, we're also recognized for bar, uh, bar passage over performance. So that is the percentage of our students who pass the bar relative to their entering credentials. And we are number five in the nation for that. Um, we're also a best value law school, as Dean Reed mentioned. Our tuition is the most affordable in the state of Georgia and amongst the most affordable in the nation. And then, of course, we have that robust part-time program. And students in our part-time program, you have access to all the same resources, programs, and services as students in our full-time program. You can still do law review. You can still do moot court. You can still do student trial advocacy. 
you can still um, be in leadership positions in student organizations that are student bar association. Um, and um, I should mention our classes. So um, all of our full-time faculty teach both in the day and evening program. So you will get the access to those same professors. Um, uh, and just so you know, we have, uh, we were proud to be the public law school in Georgia that had a part-time program, we're the only one. So people did not have to quit their jobs or, you know, we recognize you have other commitments and obligations, but you can do that at the same time while pursuing a legal education. Um, just sharing other points of pride, so our ultimate bar passage rate, that's the percentage of our students who take and pass a bar exam within two years of graduation. And for the class that graduated in 2019, because again, we tracked them two years out, um, it was just under 98%. We're expecting to have um, updated results for the class of 2020. And for employment outcomes, so the class of 2022, those who graduated <coughs> last year, 93% were employed within 10 months of graduation. So again, we are very proud of that. So for degree options, most of you are likely inter uh, interested in our Juris Doctor program. This is the first professional law degree in the United States that will enable you to sit for a bar exam. We are fully accredited by the American Bar Association and the American Association of Law Schools, so you can sit for the bar in any U.S. jurisdiction. Um, I'll talk a little bit more about our Panther Scholars Program, and that is specifically for uh, select um, undergraduates or graduates of Georgia State University. But most of you will likely be applying as regular first year um, students. Can I get just a sense in the room how many people are thinking of applying for fall 2023? So wanting to start class in August. Okay, and how many are fall 2024 or later? Okay, good. So I will be sure to cover both um, as we go along. As Dean Reed mentioned, we do have our Masters of Law. So we have our foreign trained attorneys, those who've earned their uh, law degree in a foreign country and are currently licensed to practice there. And so they can complete our LLM for the practice of law in the United States, which will enable them to sit for the bar exam in any U.S. jurisdiction. We also have a pro an LLM program for U.S. trained lawyers. So those who've earned their JD in the U.S. and now they want some additional specialization in health law, environmental and land use, intellectual property, legal analytics, or general studies. We also have a number of dual degrees where you will pursue your law degree and a master's concurrently. So you're doing them concurrently, but you don't have to start them at the same time. So people, so you need to, admit it, to be admitted to both programs separately. We strongly recommend that you apply and be admitted to the College of Law first because that is the more competitive program. And then because the first year curriculum is prescribed, you have no say in your classes, your first year. We pick them for you. Um, and uh, actually on the reverse of the ad grants, you'll see what a sample schedule looks like full-time versus part-time. Um, so your first year is already set. Then during your first year, you apply to that master's program and they will accept your LSAT score in lieu of the GRE or GMAT, so you do not have to take an additional standardized test. Um, just so that you know, you will start taking the graduate courses starting as soon as the summer after your first year, and then going forward, you'll take a combination of law and graduate courses. And uh, with the exception of public health, public health, you can actually complete both the JD and that a master's in public health in three years. Um, but for most of the programs, it will be in four years. So about 12 of your law credits will count towards your master's. 12 of your master's credits will count towards your law degree. So you'll be saving time if you were supposed to do both programs separately. I say think judici judiciously about whether or not you want to do a dual degree. I did one, so I'm an advocate and I'm a proponent of them. But you really have to think of the added value. Depending on your future goals, you may be able to get there with just one of those degrees. Um, if you are doing a dual degree, you have to factor in that it's an additional year's worth of debt. It's also an additional year's worth of um, deferred income, right? So you need to kind of weigh those, uh, those options. If you don't want to do a dual degree, but you're interested in taking some classes, say, in 
social work or public health or the College of Business, you can take up to two graduate level classes outside of the College of Law that will count towards your law degree. We also have a number of certificates. So I often hear from students, you know, what do I need to specialize in when I'm in law school? You actually don't need to specialize, right? You're gonna have the same Juris Doctor degree that students at any AB approved law school will have. Certificates are a way that you can demonstrate your expertise in certain areas. They're not required, um, and the these have actually come up based on faculty expertise because we do have such deep, such depth, I should say, in our faculty in these areas. So we have certificates in advocacy, in health law, environmental and land use, in intellectual property, legal analytics, public interest law and policy, and our most popular one right now is entertainment media um, and sports law. So I mentioned the Panther Scholars Program. So what is Panther Scholars? So it is an application process for candidates who've carefully considered their law school options, and they're confident that Georgia State Law is their number one choice. So what this does um, is that it waives the LSAT for understa um, outstanding undergraduate students and recent graduates from Georgia State University. And this is based on an ABA standard, so there are very strict rules for who can qualify for Panther Scholars. There is no flexibility. In law school, this would be what we call a three-part test. You have to meet all three prongs to be able to be eligible for this. So the American Bar Association requires a valid and reliable standardized test for admission to law school. So um, for most of our uh, applicants, that is the LSAT. There are schools right now that will accept other um, test scores. There's some that will accept the GRE or GMAT. We are not yet at that point. That doesn't mean we may not get there. We may get there, but for right now, the LSAT is the valid and reliable test that we accept for regular first year students. So uh, for Panther scholars, if you had an SAT or ACT score, so your prior um, standardized test score at the 85th percentile or higher, and you had a cumulative undergraduate GPA of 3.5 or higher, and you took six full-time semesters at Georgia State University, you can apply to a Panther Scholars. What this is saying is that your prior standardized test performance, so that 85th percentile on the SAT which translates to about, um, about 1240 or so on the SAT, about 28 on the ACT, depending on when you took it, that though that test score was a good indicator of how you would do it undergrad, which is why you had that 3.5 or higher. And therefore, that's gonna be a good predictor of your likelihood of success in law school. So again, three prong test. First prong, must have that ACT or SAT score at the 85th percentile or higher. Not the 84th, not the 83rd, <laughs> the 85th percentile at the time you took the test. You must have a 3.5 GPA or higher in your undergraduate program at Georgia State University, and you must have completed at least six full-time semesters at Georgia State. So sometimes this can get a little tricky because we have students like the who might have done dual enrollment or had advanced placement uh, credits. So, um, but you could still be eligible as long as you had six semesters where you took a minimum of 12 credits. That includes summers. So 12 credits including summers um, for uh, six semesters at Georgia State. If you meet those three criteria, you can apply through Panther Scholars and that waives the LSAT. So because this is such a unique program and there are limits on the number of people that we can admit in our program through Panther Scholars each year, there is an expedited timeline. So Panther Scholars is no longer an option for you if you're applying for fall of 2023. But if you're applying for fall of 2024, which would be next year's cycle, then you certainly could apply with Panther Scholars. It has a more compressed application timeline. The application opens September 1st. Um, it closes on November 1st, which means we need to have all the components of your application by November 1st. You will receive a decision by January 15th of the following year, 
And if you are extended an offer of admission through Panther Scholars, you must pay a seat deposit of $500 by March 15th to secure your seat in the class. We have this expedited timeline, so if you are not admitted via Panther Scholars, you could still take, you could take the LSAT, right? So if you are admitted and want to enroll as a Panther Scholar, you agree not to take the LSAT. If you take the LSAT, that waives, that voids admission. But if you're not admitted via Panther Scholars, you can still apply as a regular first year applicant, but you will have to take the LSAT. So these are dates for fall 2023, but this is pretty similar to what it will be for fall 2024. So our application opens September 1st of each year. The admissions committee starts reviewing files for decision around mid-October. And we do have a priority deadline of March 15th for scholarship consideration. That is, your application should be complete. You should have all the components in your application by March 15th um, to be in the best possible shape for scholarship. Does that mean that we can't consider you for scholarship if you are admitted after this date? We certainly can, however, I cannot guarantee that we will have any remaining scholarship funds, so it's always better to apply earlier rather than later. And then our application cycle closes June 1st. So we are still accepting applications for fall 2023. I can tell you our first deposit deadline is today. So deposits are coming in, and there is a strong possibility that we will exceed, well, we'll be at um, the maximum for our day program, right? So if you're applying later in the cycle, should be flexible with your enrollment options. We generally have room in the part-time evening program, but the full-time day and to some extent the part-time day are very popular, so those tend to be the ones that um, we need the capacity at um, soonest. So for those of you who are still planning to apply for, uh, for fall 2023, we do accept the June LSAT, so you have to get your um, get your application in by June first, midnight, June first, Eastern Daylight Time, um, and then the other things can come to us after that date. So the other things are the components of the application that I'm going to talk to you about right now. So we require a completed application. You actually do this through the Law School Admissions Council. We do have a fifty dollar application fee that is non refundable. But the fact that you are here today, and if you're applying for fall 2023 and you've not yet applied, we would be delighted to provide you with a fee waiver. And we do require a valid and reportable LSAT score unless you're applying through Panther Scholars, right? So the LSAT is offered nine times for both this year and next year's cycle. So there's actually a test yesterday, today, tomorrow, depending on when you're taking it. Um, there will also be a June test, which again I mentioned we do apply for, um, we accept for fall 2023. So it's available every month with the exception of, uh, let's see, with the exception of May um, and December, and this year I believe it was um, March. So uh, we prefer to see scores within the last two years, right? If you take the LSAT multiple times, we'll see all reportable scores, and we will take your highest LSAT score into consideration for both admission and scholarship. But just know that if you have a reported score, we will see it. If you cancel your score, we will not see it. We also uh, require that you subscribe to the Credential Assembly Service through LSAC. And think of that as the part of the application that other people are responsible for. Right? So this is where you would send transcripts. Your transcripts will go directly from those institutions to LSAC. So transcripts from every post-secondary institution where you have earned academic credit. So if you did community college, if you did study abroad, if you did a graduate degree, all or graduate degrees, all of those transcripts need to go to LSAC. They're going to compile a report that they will send to us and every other school to which you are applying. And that report will include grades, everything leading up to and into your first bachelor's degree, right? So they're going to standardize your GPA. They're gonna tell us how your performance every year, how that compared to other, else, other law school applicants from your institution. 
So it allows us to see how you compare with people at the institution that you attended, but also the rest of the applicant pool. This is also where your recommenders will send their letters of recommendation. We require a minimum of two letters of recommendation. We'll accept as many as four. So I need some participation here. Who are people you should not ask for letters of recommendation? Your state representatives, your senators, or congressmen. That's a good one, and I'll give you a little addendum on that later on. Yes. Family members, right? Do you know I see letters of recommendation from mothers on no. whatever contributed to that? You can do a diversity statement. I'll talk about that a little bit later. And you know, we do have Tamara, who's from uh, Washington here. You can do a non-resident addendum. So we are um, a public institution in the state of Georgia. I can tell you about 50% of our applicants come from outside of Georgia. But in our class each year, anywhere between 80 to 85% of class will be Georgia residents. So when we are reviewing your application, we want to see, do you have a connection to Georgia? Do you have a connection to Georgia State? Is there something about us that really appeals to you? It could be your unique program, it could be our location, it could be this is where you want to launch your career. Those things do get factored into the decision making. So what should you say in your personal statement? The first thing is, follow the instructions given by any school that you are applying. Some schools might have a specific prompt, right? Um, but a good part for you to start is why do you want to study law? Why do you have a specific interest in this school? Could it be our location in downtown Atlanta? Could it be our world-renowned health law program? Could it be that we have a robust part-time program? Whatever it is, you know, be sure to put that in. Um, show how you've matured, right? You can talk about an event or an issue that is of particular importance to you. We've seen in the last few years, we've seen more students talk about their interest in social justice that came out of the protests after George Floyd. Whatever it is, you can talk about that, but this should be your story, the personal statement. Um, describe what you learned from a mentor, from a class, or an experience that you had. But keep in mind that this should be an authentic writing sample. We want to get a sense of who you are separate from what we can see in the rest of your application. So for those who are applying to multiple law schools, we know that you'll probably use the same base personal statement to, um, to when you're applying to multiple schools. I would say be very careful, right? I have seen great personal statements that reference some other law school, and that's just a step in the art. And then there are ones that reference programs that we don't have, right? We've been around for over 100 years. No, we haven't. We're only 40 years old, right? So uh, make sure attention to detail is important. So if you are using that same base personal statement and applying to multiple institutions, make sure that you get the name of the school right. Save the personal statement as GSU personal statement. So you know that only GSU should be referenced in that personal statement. What should you do an addendum? So I mentioned that you'd have to do an addendum for any character and fitness issues you had, whether it was academic or um, criminal. But this is also a way to address any weaknesses in your application. Right now, most of you were impacted by COVID in some way. So in some schools, you went pass fail, right? So, um, or some schools, it, there were um, kind of adjustments in the grading scale. Sometimes you weren't able to have the experiential learning opportunities that you had intended to have. For some, you had to go to virtual learning and that was not your best style of learning. You never want us to assume, right? I'm like, what happened this semester, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. You went to every party on campus. That's what I will assume, right? You went to every football game, every uh, basketball game. But if there was something that really had an impact on your performance, it could be that you were ill, or we've had people who had family members who were going through pretty severe um, life issues. Something that had an impact on your performance, you can do that in an addendum. It should be brief, generally no more than a paragraph or two. You can also use that to emphasize particular strengths. I see students who are double majors, triple majors, double majors with a minor. Like, yeah, this is something that you definitely want to emphasize that you have mastered you know, multiple areas of study. It should be separate and distinct from your personal statement. It can be complementary. 
but you should not be repeating the same things that it are in your personal statement. Again, should be brief, it should be succinct, it should be honest, right? So for some students, particularly those who might have had a rocky semester, so this is not where the teacher had it in for me, right? This is where we want you to take some responsibility. Acknowledge there are students who didn't realize um, that there were um, resources available to them. There are people who had a late diagnosis of a learning disability. And once they were able to get the appropriate accommodations, they were able to do well, right? There are people who are in the wrong major. I can't tell you how many pre-med engineering people or guys came to build them. And once they changed their major to something that was a better fit, there was that improvement in their grade. But this is an opportunity for you to give a sympathetic explanation and assure the admissions committee that that similar weakness will not occur while you are in law school. So, yes? A quick question on the addendum. Um, so let's say you're explaining a weakness and then you want to you know, Yes. Well, assume they're different addendums, right? So, so they could be, or it could be one paragraph okay. and then the other paragraph. Okay. Yes, so you can certainly do it that way. That's a good question. So, diversity statement. So how many of you know that the Supreme Court right now has two cases before it that will determine whether or not we consider race as a factor in education, right? So we're expecting the results of uh, that to come out in um, sometime this summer. That being said, the American Bar Association actually asked us, what are we doing to build a diverse class, right? So even if we cannot consider race as a factor in the admissions decision, as Justice Katanji Brown Jackson said, you can share your lived experiences, right? That is a part of who you are. So, um, so for a diversity statement, that could be, we don't require it, it's optional, it's an optional agenda. But this could be what makes you unique as a law student. It could be that you're a first generation college graduate or you're gonna be a first generation professional um, student. It could be that you are first generation American or from an immigrant background. It could be that you're from non-traditional family backgrounds. We had students that grew up in foster care or grew up with, um, with uh, in single parent family households or with grandparents. It could be that you're a non-traditional student you're not that K through JV that we talked about. You've taken time off. You now have these lived experiences um, that will just enrich the classroom culture. It could be that you're from an underrepresented group uh, in the law. It could be your LGBTQ status. It could be that you have a disability or, um, or challenges that you've overcome in your life. It could be geographic diversity. We are located right in the heart of downtown Atlanta. We have applicants each year with people who are from around the country, around the world, from rural Georgia, from small towns. Anything that will um, demonstrate how you are diverse and will enrich the uh, classroom, you can do that in a diversity statement. So I want to share a little bit about the class profile for the fall 2022 class. So they are currently first year students. Um, this will be updated when the class matriculates in August of 2020, uh, 2023. So we have just under 200 applications. We admitted about 580 of those. So less than 30% of those who apply are extended an offer of admission. It is pretty competitive, right? And of that 580, about 40% of those accepted or offer of admission. So we enrolled a class of about 201. We're expecting about 210 in our class this year. Uh, Dean Reed mentioned that we're proud of the diversity that we have in our class. The average age of our class was 26. The age range was 19 to 56. Um, in terms of gender, about 40% of our students were male, 59% female, um, less than 1% um, uh, other identification. I should mention, we have had more law, female law students enroll in law school for the last several years. That's not unique to Georgia State. That's just kind of a demographic shift that we're seeing in law schools. 38% um, of our students self-identified as being students of color. Um, and there's kind of a more detailed breakdown of that. Um, about 15% were black or African American. Uh, about 11% Hispanic, Latino, about 9% Asian, 3% uh, did not indicate, but again, pretty diverse student body. 
We enrolled about 157 students in our full-time program. I mentioned that is the program that's most in demand, and it's also the, the, um, the first to be capped. And 44 were part-time students, and that included part-time day and part-time evening. Uh, we had about 77 undergraduate institutions rep um, represented. How many full dogs do we have in the room? No new dogs? All right, because that is our number one feeder school, okay? How many Panthers? How many? All right, our number two feeder school. So, um, but we're really proud of um, the various undergrad in, um, institutions. 53 majors. You do not have to do political science. You do not have to be a pre-law major. All roads lead to law, right? <laughs> so it just makes for a richer classroom. And about 22 of our students had graduate degrees in some form. So we've had students with MDs, with PhDs, EDs, master's degrees. Um, 20 states represented and about 17 countries in our class. So the entering class credentials. So when we are looking at candidates for admission, mm -hmm. the only objective factors that we have are your LSAT score and your GPA. Of course, the other things are important, right? We're paying close attention to your personal statement, your letters of recommendation, we're looking at that agenda. We're looking, we're doing a whole person review. But your LSAT score and GPA are good, <coughs> not perfect. They're good predictors of the likely, likelihood of performance in your first year. Do we have students who underperform their indicators every year? Yes. Do we have students who overperform their indicators every year? Yes. But for the majority of our students, they tend to fall um, as predicted with their LSAT score and GPA. Our full-time program is that much more competitive. So the median LSAT score for that class was 161. The median GPA for our part, the median LSAT score for our part-time program was 157. The uh, median LSAT score across programs was 160. So again, that full-time program is more competitive. We also recognize that for students who are in our part-time program, oftentimes you're more removed from your undergrad experience, right? Or they're more likely to have graduate degrees, significant work experience, significant life experience. So we see so, and that is reflected in your application and we take those things into consideration. GPA-wise, the median GPA for the full-time program was 361. Median GPA for the part-time program, 3.49, a little bit lower. Median GPA overall, 3.61. Can you be admitted with credentials less than or median? Absolutely. 50% of our class is admitted every year with credentials less than or median. But we do weigh your LSAT score and GPA fairly equally. So if one is lower, the other one matters that much more, right? So. Every year I get students who say, my LSAT score and GPA are not good indicators of the likelihood of success in law school. Mm -hmm. I'm like, okay, then what is, right? Tell me what is. Because the American Bar Association mandates that we only admit students who appear co capable of completing our program of legal education and being admitted to the bar. So we think very carefully about with the information that we have, for each student and how you compare with, with the pool and how our students have performed historically in making determinations as to who will be successful in our class each year. And for those to whom we extend an offer of admission uh, and those who join our class each year, the vast majority of students are successful. Our attrition rate, so that's the percentage of our students who either choose to leave law school after a year or are dismissed for academic reasons is very low. It is under 2%. So we take this information very, very seriously. Just want to share a little bit about our programs and services. We have some things that are a little unique to Georgia State Law. So we have a required first year academic success and professional development course. And that is for all students, whether you're in our day program or evening program, full-time or part-time. The first 10 weeks of that will be devoted to academic success. How to, uh, how to prepare for class, how to brief cases, how to outline, how to attack essay exams, how to attack multiple choice exams. Then the remainder of that course will be devoted to professional development, resume, cover letter, 
mock interviews, how to d develop your elevator pitch, right? If you're in an elevator with someone, how do you how do you introduce yourself in that short time that you have? Go ahead. Have you guys offer for admitted students the summer prior or anything like this? Yes, we do. So for admitted students, there is a, 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 a 1L summer preparation program. And uh, so students who are admitted for the fall will receive information about that, usually in about June. And um, in the past, it's been Harvard 0L, um, but we're exploring other programs. But basically, that will be kind of a little mini lectures, um, and then sample questions, and then sample answers, just so that you have some exposure to what law school will be like. Real quick follow-up, I'm 10 years removed from, from college. Yes. Uh, uh, so for those who have a job, yes. who are applying part-time, yep. is this during the day, is there options to do it in the evening? It's asynchronous, so you can do it whenever you want, right? So um, so we will have to provide your credentials to whoever, whichever third-party service will provide, be providing that. Um, and then you can access it on demand. So that's the, for the purpose of that. And that's also true for or um, or students who are in our part-time program. So I mentioned you have access to all the same resources, program services. That includes um, academic success, it includes the library, it includes um, faculty office hours. So um, it includes our Center for Professional Development and Career Strategies that work with students to help them to be in the best possible shape for employment while they're in law school and also after graduation. There are evening sessions. Sometimes a session might be offered live at noon from 12 to 1, and then recorded so that it's available for students um, who are in our evening program or who weren't able to attend uh, live. Then you have access to externships and internships. So externships are academic in nature. You are going to receive credit for the work that you are doing. You're doing actual legal work. You're working under the supervision of licensed attorneys. And um, internships, you're getting experience, but you can't be paid. We're proud that we have about 50 different student organizations here and a number of co-curricular activities, including Law Review, Moot Court, and our Student Trial Lawyers Association. We're proud of our clinics. So think of clinics as being a law firm within the law school that serves actual clients. So we're known for our health law program. We have a health clinic, low-income taxpayer, immigration, community development, entrepreneurship. This is a uh, new clinic. It will be enrolling students in spring of 2024. We also have disability rights, the Capital Defender Clinic, and mediation. So tuition and fees. I mentioned that we are a best value law school. What that translates for residents of Georgia in our full-time program is $17,202. For a non-resident, that's at just under $37,000. And with our cost of attendance, so what we ex anticipate your expenses would be for that semester um, is for the year, should be for the academic year. Just under 40000 for a resident of Georgia, just under 60000 for a non-resident. Whoops. For students in our part-time program, we estimate that would be under 16000 for, uh, for the year. Resident, Non-residents, just under $34,000. So how do our students pay for law school? The majority of our students do borrow student loans, whether federal or private. We do have scholarships. I was telling to someone earlier that um, it, we, so we're proud of our best value ranking, the fact that our tuition is so affordable. But the state of Georgia has this unique requirement that we cannot use state funds to subsidize tuition. So our scholarships have to come from philanthropy. The challenge with that is that we're such a young law school, so we have very giving alums. They're just not at the point where they can give a lot, <laughs> right? So scholarships are pretty competitive. So they are limited in number and they're limited in amount. So the average scholarship amount for students is just about $2,000. Um, but we do offer some graduate assistant positions. And a graduate, graduate assistantship would be for your subsequent years in law school, so not your first year but you could be awarded as a part of your scholarship package through admission. It could be a partial or full uh, GA <coughs> opportunity that will waive a portion or all of tuition, and then there's a stipend with the expectation of your working five to 10 hours per week with a department at the College of Law or with a center or a faculty member. We also have a limited number of non-resident tuition waivers, which waive the out-of-state tuition rate. 
you will, um, there is a separate application of, uh, for this, so we generally advise students about how to apply for those um, shortly after admission. And I know time is up the essence, but I do have time to take some questions. Yes? Yeah, so we've got assistant positions. If you're, if you're in the thing before coming here, I was at the University of Washington School of Law in Seattle for 13 years, so almost as much time here as back in the Pacific Northwest. Uh, most of the courses that I teach here at Georgia State are in the area of wills, trusts, and estates, as well as federal taxation. This semester, I'm teaching property in our evening program. So I have the first year students in their second semester of law school, and we huddle up for four hours every Wednesday night and talk all the fascinating things, property law. They pay for the whole seat, but they only need <laughs> uh, given that today is April 15, it strikes me as appropriate for me to maybe lean in to my background in tax law as we talk a little bit about how the tax law works and give you some exposure to what you might expect to see in the typical law school class. Normally, you would have received a reading assignment of anywhere from 15 to 30 pages in length that would require you to read a number of judicial opinions, perhaps some additional supplemental sources. Uh, because I teach tax law, we also take a pretty good look at Title 26 of the United States Code, known as the Internal Revenue Code, or just to all of us who study it, the holy and sacred text. <laughs> uh, that tax law is the formation, is gonna be the basis of what we would do, and normally you would be getting some stuff ahead of time to be able to read, but because we wanted to encourage attendance rather than to discourage attendance, we didn't give you a reading assignment for today, but that's okay. We can give you enough background information before we have a discussion. Regardless of whether you are talking about an income tax or a sales tax or real property taxes or the like, every tax is computed with reference to a tax base, and that tax base is applied to a rate of tax. So when I pay real property tax, for example, the tax base is the fair market value of my real estate, and the rate is set at a set percentage. So whatever is that percentage of the assessed fair market value of my property, that's the amount of property tax that I have to pay. Sales tax is the same thing. Basically, this is the retail sales price of an item times whatever is the applicable state and local tax rate. For the federal income tax that most of us in the room are intimately too familiar with, perhaps, uh, the tax taxable income you have, uh, our system uses what we call progressive tax rates. That is, everybody's first dollar of taxable income is taxed at a lower rate, 10% tax on the first dollar of taxable income. We all do. But then, if you start to progress into the other brackets, as your taxable income goes up, the rate of tax that applies on your last dollar will likewise go up. So if you have taxable income of $100,000 and you are unmarried, well, use a dollar sign as your profile pick. <laughs> Somebody will be swiping right and you won't be unmarried by the end of the year. Uh, but if you have $100,000, can you see from the chart where your last dollar would be taxed at 24%? because your taxable income exceeds $95,375, right? Mm -hmm. So that person would say, well, I'm in the 24% bracket. That's a little bit misleading, of course, because you're ignoring the fact that, well, the first $11,000 was only taxed at 10%, and then another chunk was only being taxed at 12%, and so on up. But the last dollar, to say that you're in the 24% marginal bracket, is gonna be an accurate statement. Now, how is it that we go about then defining what constitutes your taxable income for a particular year? Well, here, the Internal Revenue Code, Title 26 of the United States Code is the Internal Revenue Code. Uh, section 63, and in particular subsection A of Section 63, defines a taxpayer's taxable income as gross income minus the deductions that are allowed. The way that this is reflected on the Form 1040, the individual tax return, down here at the bottom, the very last line on the first page of the return is where you have computed your taxable income figure. But in order to get there, the statute says that you have to start with this concept called gross income, which the tax return defines on line nine as your total income. I guess if we called it gross income, it would be a little stigmatizing. So on the return, employee, <laughs> flat out man. Is that tax wow. at a higher rate than secondary income? Nope. 
<laughs> nope. Income is income. You said the taxpayer in this hypothetical has $4,990 of gross income that's going to be taxed at a 37% rate. Now, all of a sudden, it's no longer a $10 pay table, right? Mm -hmm. Now, all of a sudden, it's become a $1,500 pay table by the time that we pay our taxes. So under the bargain purchase rule, we say that when you buy property at a discount, you don't have gross income because the benefit of the bargain has not yet been realized. Y'all have a talent for this. You should be looking at tax as not just a class, but a potential career. I mean, you know, okay, there's human rights and all that stuff, <laughs> but come on now. This is tax, right? This, this is affecting everybody you know. Not everyone you know is going to jail. I hope. Uh, <laughs> not everyone you know is going to be a victim in an auto accident, but everybody you know is affected by this stuff, right? Yeah. Next up, taxpayer buys a used piano from an unrelated party paying an amount equal to the piano's value. So mm -hmm. no bargain purchase there, just paid whatever was worth. Seven years later, while cleaning the piano, taxpayer discovers $4,000 in cash hidden inside. Lest you think these are all far-fetched, this is an actual case that came out of Ohio in the 1960s. Okay? Couple buys a piano, seven years later, when they finally get around to cleaning it, when they're like, how come every time I hit G, it just goes boom, boom, boom? Uh, it's of making it up. I don't know, just keep playing. Uh, okay, uh, we open it up and sitting on the G-string, well that's not the <laughs> <laughs> sitting on the piano cord uh, is this cash that's there. Does the married couple, do they have gross income? By the way, in the real case, of course, uh, the taxpayers had filed a return in which they included the $4,000 in gross income. At a dinner party, they're talking about how they found the cash inside the piano. I mean, that's great dinner party convo, right? Uh, and they say, yeah, but we had to pay tax on it. To which all their friends are like, you put that on your return? Right. How was the IRS going to know right. about right. that? And they right. got to thinking, they're like, you know, mm -hmm. you're right. So they're... Oh, Jesus. 835 Eight, three, five. Five. All right. Must be present win. Okay. <laughs> All right. All right. What is it? It's a mug with some goodies. Oh, that's cute. Okay. Um. Okay. So oh, the last four is four, five, five, seven. Okay. Yay! Yes, okay. Me. This is not fair. <laughs> <laughs> I'll kill <laughs> All right. Mm -hmm. Let's see. Eight three five four five six zero. All right. Sorry, this side of the room. <laughs> All right. We have one more panelist joining us. I know she was parking. Um, in the meantime, were there any additional questions that you all had? That was possible. And you actually have the ability in some situations to get an externship credit for your job if it meets certain metrics. So that's one way. And I would say there are more, there's a plethora of more opportunities. You have to get creative. Like maybe your hours are, you know, you may be doing something at night that's maybe like research or something like that with a partner or more like. Um, drafting, things like that, but there are opportunities that I understand would be great. Hi guys. Okay, this is the reception we had after the open house. I only had courage enough to taste the brownie and get some fresh strawberries and pineapple out that fruit bowl, but they had um, crab dip, spinach dip, they had meatballs, spring rolls, um, a sauteed chicken um on a stick kind of like a shish kebab um they had beef empanadas they had a lot of things to offer here but i wasn't in the mood to try anything i just wanted some fresh fruit really and this has been so nice if you're interested in law school and you live in the atlanta georgia area you may want to consider georgia state university not only is it extremely affordable it's a great network, great opportunity, and you're right in the heart of all the law experience. You could imagine the Georgia court system, Fulton County Superior Courts, 
you have big law down here, the corporate law firms, and the list goes on and on, advocacy as well.